This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by the Writing Mastery Academy. Founded by Jessica Brody, author of the best-selling plotting guide, Save the Cat Writes a Novel. The Writing Mastery Academy features online, on-demand writing courses, including the official Save the Cat Writes a Novel companion course. Novel fast drafting, crafting dynamic characters, and productivity hacks for writers to name just a few, plus monthly live webinars on various writing topics. Go to jessicabrody.com slash hank to learn more and get your first month of unlimited access to all the content for just $6. That's right, just $6. jessicabrody.com slash hank. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Jeff Arch on the show with me today. Um, you may not know Jeff as a novelist yet, uh, but I'm, I promise you know his work. Uh, you have seen it and experienced it. Uh, probably many times in your life. Uh, Jeff uh, was the uh, the screenwriter of a little movie that you may or may not have heard of, Sleepless in Seattle, uh, amongst many, many other things. Uh, his new book, Attachments, his first novel ever, is available everywhere now when you're hearing this. And this is such an amazing novel. You must have this in your to-be-read pile going into the spring and summer season when uh, when we're looking for – for new uplifting things uh, to read, this is this is a must-have. Uh, welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you. Well, you had me at must-have. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, we begin each show with the same question, okay. and that question is: What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, you know. I haven't gotten that one before, but it is it is an easy one. Uh, I, as a little kid, I was the the third of uh, three kids and the last of seven cousins, and so you know everything rolled downhill to me, and uh, it was very hard to have your voice heard. And so you know, I discovered early on that if I wrote something down, they would stop and listen, and they would stop and read it. And and, and another thing was if I wrote something down. And let's say it was funny. I mean, you know, we're talking seven or eight year old funny, but everybody was older than me. So if you can get a laugh from older people. That's a good thing. And, and nobody was being kind. If it wasn't funny, nobody laughed. But oh, I remember once noticing that uh, somebody was laughing in the other room because somebody else showed them something that I'd written. And I wasn't even in the room. And I hadn't I didn't even write it just then. I must have done it like a week ago or something. And it got a laugh. But I got a laugh for something I'd already done, and I didn't have to be in the room when it happened. So <laughs> it was put that was the beginning of a, I mean, I must have been six or seven years old, but I realized two things. You know, uh, first of all, you have the power to do this without even being there, that you could leave these marks on a piece of paper, and someone would say, Look at this. You know, I never heard anybody say, Oh, what about that interesting thing Jeff said the other day? But, <laughs> you know, they showed somebody, and, and, I also learned without ever knowing what the concept of money was, but I learned what royalties were, you know, um, to get to get paid today for something you did before. And uh, so the royalties weren't money. The royalties were the feeling that I got from, you know, the payoff of somebody laughing and enjoying something that I had done. So I noticed that every time I put something down on a piece of paper, left it behind, stuck it on a wall, put it on the refrigerator, I got attention for it. And that thing where, you know, you can talk over somebody's conversation, but when you're reading something, you're reading it. So I didn't just right. have their attention. I had all their attention. And uh, that's a feeling of power. So I got, I got, you know, the royalty from the joy of it, but I also got this feeling of power. I can make people stop and stop what they're doing and pay attention and then maybe get a little, you know, little, little, little of that sun will shine on me. 
Wow. Um, from from doing that at seven years old uh, and and getting a laugh, uh, you know, from people. Um, where do you think your your love of of humor and and comedy comes from? Well, you know, Hank, you are asking some really good questions. Um, <laughs> again, I I have this. You know, it came from rescue, laughter, humor. I was in a very early situation, like a dinner table deal, probably around the same time, six or seven years old, maybe probably even younger. And you know that. Uh, you're too young to articulate anything, but you know that sense of when something really heavy just went down and that silence. Yeah. So in this memory, it's possible I said something and it did not land, you know? And so the big <laughs> tension was in the room. And then my older brother said something and everybody laughed. And suddenly all the heat was off. And this good feeling was there. And I remember thinking, whatever that was, I want to be able to do that because it was a way of making peace out of war. And, you know, right away, if, the, if that awful feeling of tension of wrongness can go away just like that, I wanted to learn how to do that. So I learned that humor was a, it's a safety mechanism. It can be a weapon. You know, I, I learned that early on too, Jeff, um, having an older sister who um you know that the, we were thick as thieves when we were little and um you know when when we would invariably um do something that got us in trouble with the parents um she was the the child who would go in and fess up and you know lay herself uh, you know at the mercy of the court and i figured out pretty early on that if I could make them laugh, I could diffuse the situation <laughs> and, exactly. uh, you, you know, different approaches. Um, but, uh, no, you know, but diffuse, I, that's the word. Look at yes. all the things that laughter diffuses. Exactly. And, and the few, you know, when you really take that completely apart, a fuse is something that's about to explode. If you right. diffuse, you save something before it explodes. Isn't right. that a, a, just a, I mean, what a peaceful message. Exactly. Um, so, Jeff, you know, from that early experience and um, and and learning that that uh, that writing and 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 storytelling would pay dividends in in multiple different um, ways. Uh, when did you start thinking about this as a career? Um, that that this thing that you could do not only would pay dividends. In, in your relationship with people and, and getting positive responses from people. Um, but when did you start thinking that this was something that could pay other sorts of dividends that, um, you know, that, that literally could, could pay your bills? Well, in, in my very early 20s, uh, I, I, you know, I always had that, that ability to write and get away with things. I mean, I wrote my way out of math classes when I was in high school. So I, I had that part down. I knew how to you know, move people with a word, but I did not know there was such a th thing as a career writing movies. Uh, I just, you know, I came from, you, you sound Pennsylvania, Hank, I came from Harrisburg, and, you know, if there were people making movies, they all came from somewhere else, so it just was this unapproachable other world. But I wanted to learn something tangible, I wanted to learn how to make movies, so I, I went to Emerson College in Boston, that at the time in the early 70s, they sort of had this system where you didn't have to do that thing where you take two years of core classes so they can get that one tasty elective that you want. You just dove in. So from the first week of school, I was taking film production, television production, theater production classes, and I spent four years doing that. Really, I spent three years doing that. And the last year, I was working out in the field and just getting credit. Uh, <clears throat> because, And I wanted a hands-on, you know, something tangible. I, I learned how to make movies from every single department there is. That's what I love doing, making movies. And I still loved it. And uh, I got into, I veered towards cinematography and lighting. I, I had a mentor who taught me all about movie lighting. And I was one of the few people in the Boston area who knew how to do that. So I was pretty much in demand. But I wanted to make feature films. Uh, in Boston at the time, it was, uh, you know, documentaries, educational films, public service, all important stuff. But I didn't grow up watching that stuff. I grew up watching Hollywood movies, and that's what I wanted to make. And also, Hollywood has this thing of being in Los Angeles that has completely different weather from Boston. 
So I was really interested in that. And I moved out in my early 20s and made made friends, just just the kind of boldness you have when you're 21. I sought out a cameraman uh, named Conrad Hall, who was <clears throat> an Oscar, multiple Oscar winner, multiple, multiple Oscar nominee for some of the iconic movies that I grew up on, like uh, Cool Hand Luke and Butch Cassidy and Marathon Man and all kinds of, and he's just venerated. And so to be a film student and a camera guy <clears throat> that was the top of the hill. And I called him up once just out of nothing. And he answered the phone and called me back. And we began like a, I wouldn't say friendship. We didn't go hanging out, but I would see him and he'd spend some time with me and give me advice. And at that particular time in his career, he was kind of sour on being a feature filmmaker, cameraman. And I was uh, coming up trying to do the job that he had. And he looked at my stuff and he said, you're, you're really good. You know, I'll help you get into union. I'll help you get into AFI if that's what you want. Tell me what you need. But here's the thing. You're going to hate this. And he just, where he was in the business at the time or whatever, he said, you're, you're not going to like this job. It's going to take you 15 years working your way up through the unions to get to do what you're able to do right now. And I can tell already, you're not going to have the patience. If you can write, you should write because this is the era of the writer. And he was right. And I listened to him. I took, I took, you know, camera, I took advice from my favorite cameraman. What he told me to do was write if I could, and I could. And at that time, uh, it was the era of the screenwriter. It started with Bill Goldman when he, when he wrote Butch Cassidy and sold that on the open market. That had never been done before. So the studio system had broken up and writers were uh, writing spec scripts and getting in that way. And that was the only way I knew how to get in. It, it was kind of like, you know, in Star Wars, there was that one little thing on the Death Star. You know, if you hit that right. little button, you, you break the whole thing. The only way in was to write a script that somebody wanted enough to buy, even though you were completely unknown. And enough people had done it at that point to prove this can be done. So I said, well, that's what I'll do. I'll write a movie that everybody wants to buy. And that took uh, 17 years <laughs> instead of 15. But <laughs> I didn't know at the time it was going to, you know, it wasn't prescribed, but that's what it was. Advice from a, a director of photography, hero of mine, when I was an up and coming director of photography, he said, This game will drive you crazy. You need to write. And uh, writing drove me crazy too, but it was more, you know, it was more in line with who I was going to develop into be anyway. So he, he was more prescient than he could have known. The life of a cameraman is not one I wouldn't have been able to sustain for long. There's too much travel. Uh, you know, it's, it was great in your twenties and I don't, now that I can see what that whole job was like, I wouldn't have wanted to do it. So he was, he was an angel. Wow. From, from the advice that you got from him that, uh, that the, the industry was, was a writer's industry at the time. Did, did he know that, that you had a propensity for this, uh, or was that just advice that then you said, oh, I, you know, I can do this. Um, did he, when he gave you that advice, did he know that you had that in you? I don't think he did. I, I, I think you're like just hitting home runs with every question. I don't, <laughs> I never thought of that. Did he, did he know at the time that I ever mentioned to him, oh, I write too? Cause I didn't write. Uh, I didn't say, well, I have a script that I started or anything like that. I, he just might've been saying offhand. It might have been if this was the year of the agent, which came later. He might have said, if you want to get in the business, you, you should be an agent. you got to take the training program. He said writers. And he might have known this kid is never going to make an agent. <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but, you know, different eras did come along. And I came smack when the spec script era was just about to peak. Wow. Um, Jeff, from uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with the idea of a place and and how the the places that you're you're from and and you occupy time in um have a a way of seeping in and and affecting the the type of work that you do in one way or another from from your formative years in uh in Harrisburg Pennsylvania to your college years in Boston and then uh, eventually landing on the west coast um, do you do you feel like that a sense of place uh, seeps into your work at all? Oh, always, always. I'm. It's it's funny. Just when you said that, I'm. I'm um, my wife now, 
when before we met, she she moved around a lot with her family. We're both this both second marriage. We both raised families in Santa Barbara, and she moved around a lot with her family for all kinds of different reasons. And I moved with my family maybe every five years, but sometimes within the same you know town. Uh, but it wasn't this frantic thing. And then when I met her, I started moving around with her. All these, and I was looking for like the last ten or so years for that place, the place that was going to be the place. Here's where we are. Here's where all our stuff is. Here's our family comes home to every time. And uh, I really needed it with, with her. Her place is when she's with her kids, that's home. So that can be anywhere. That could be on a vacation. It could be on a dinner table. It could be in traffic. I really needed a sense of place, a place to root where this is, this is home. Even if it's only going to last, you know, you never know, but I needed a sense of place. And Pennsylvania uh, I can't say that gives you more of a sense of place than anybody else. The two people growing up even in the same house might not share that. But I had a real deep sense of where I am and what the influences are around me. And uh, I soaked you know, everything up in the book. I mean, you, you'll see references to something that may have happened when I was five to something that may have happened you know, six months before the book came out. And they'll be right. And, and sometimes something was written in 1988. That sentence is sitting right next to a sentence I wrote in February. They're all connected. But and the book itself has a deep sense of place. If you don't feel like you're in Pennsylvania when you're reading that, I did something wrong. But right. it's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, and place is really important in terms of just where I am. I always want I'm really lucky. I mean, most people would agree with this. I, get, I always really want to live in a, in a place that has a lot of visual beauty. And sure. I've been able to I've been able to pull that off. So I've had places where people just go, how can you work here? And, and I'll, you know, here's this ocean, there's dolphins outside and then go, how can you work here? And I'll say, how can somebody work in an office tower? I don't get that. Right. Right. So, you know, just just different. You know, and I this is the thing you said before about, um, you know, when we use humor as a you, you did the same thing when you use humor to, to diffuse situations. Um, there's what makes you use it. There's what makes you use humor, but there's what makes you think funny in the first place. That I don't think we, I don't think we take that on. I think, you know, we're imprinted that way. We, we just come in with a way of seeing things in a funny way. And I think the farther down you are in a family chain, the more opportunities you have to observe things because you're just watching everything go on around you. And I definitely had that experience just being not on the outside, not on the inside, but just on the edge where you could jump from one to the other and just watch everything that happened. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web jeff when uh when we were talking before we started the the show um we were we were sharing some thoughts about um 
you know, just the, the state of the industry and, and, and how people get their breaks and, and that sort of thing. Um, you worked for quite a while before um, this sort of big break uh, of, of Sleepless in Seattle, the, the, the great Tom Hanks and, and Meg Ryan movie that, that we're all familiar with. Um, when you have a project that kind of goes supernova like Sleepless in Seattle did, um, did that change the the trajectory of, of your career? Did 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 things get easier after that or um, or when that was over, um, you know, are you then faced like we all are uh, in starting your next project that the, the fame of the past um, is is all negated when you're staring at the blank page? Um, what was it like after that project? And. Did, did it get easier to to pitch another one or, um, you know, do, do you still deal with the same fears and insecurities that that every other writer does when you're staring at that blank page? Well, it's never it's never e- different things get easier, but it's never easy. Uh, the job, if you're a writer, you know, no matter what the medium is, if you're any kind of an artist, your your job is to grow. So you don't grow by repeating your last victory. You go by taking on something that's going to challenge you even more. So I wish it weren't so. Every time I finished something, I kept promising myself the next one's going to be easier, and they never are. So uh, the writing itself is always harder. And when you think about it, if you're writing for a higher level of people, you better write at a higher level or you're not going to be hired by a higher level of people. But just career-wise, by the... You know, that gap, the, the movie, the script sold in 1990, and the movie came out, right, it shot in 92, and it came out in 93. And But between the sale and when the movie came out, I got hired, I was busier than you can imagine. So by the time the movie came out, by the time the nominations came out, I was already booked for two years. But I was booked wow. with people like Ron Howard and Barry Levinson and Penny Marshall, so I wasn't complaining. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I was working with the best people in the world. Maybe, I mean, I did get advice. Don't sign any of those deals and wait till the Oscar nominations and then your price can quadruple and all that stuff. And I was thinking, why, why do I wait? I mean, look at who I just named. And right. I'm working with them and I'm working with the people that are you know, one stop away from them because, you know, you don't, they're not in every single meeting. But uh, suddenly I'm, you know, working as a colleague with the best filmmakers of my generation in some cases. And and uh, that's hard work. It's hard writing at their level. I wasn't the only movie that they were developing. So, uh, you know, I would know, okay, Penny Marshall's probably developing 15 of these, but it didn't matter to me. I had the opposite of self-doubt, which is a very crazy, it wasn't arrogance. It was just, it was cause and effect. I'm going to write the one she makes. I know she's developing 20 of these. I'm going to write the one she makes. And that's not again not so much arrogance, but when that mindset goes into your work, that you're writing at that level, that you're writing a movie in a way to you trick your brain. This has already been made. This is just the day I wrote this page. Uh, it, it 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 did change, and every single one I wrote for those guys was filmable. And each case, when mine came up and it was ready to shoot, they would and you know Penny shot something else, Ron Howard shot something else, Barry Levinson shot something else, and those. Um, those opportunities went away, uh, but I got a lot of work because, okay, he's working with Penny and Barry and Ron, but the thing is, in those years where I was writing for them, when those things didn't get made, and maybe other things of mine were getting made, but not at that level, then you've gone off the radar because the next hot person has come up and the next hot person has come up, and one thing I really noticed is if I turned in the movie the day they hired me, it would have gotten made the same exact script, but they go from heat to heat. And like every six months, they call it flavor of the month, but pretty much every six months, another writer comes into vogue. So if I'm busy for two years, that's six months times four. And you just got moved a little bit off the center. And then when those three movies didn't get made, it's like, well, they didn't get made. Where's he, what's he done lately? And so when you think you're on a trajectory, you might not be on a trajectory. But for me, it was about the work and it was about getting better. And all those people made me better because you don't turn into something to run out. Or, you know, <laughs> it has to be as good as the movies that he makes. Right. And he's seeing right. they're seeing the best material in town. So, you know, who you're running with and it really keeps you sharp. I can imagine. 
Um, Jeff, you've worked in uh, in film, uh, you, you know, since the the nineteen seventies, uh, and now oh with my your God. Oh my I, God. I, <laughs> I have. Worked. It's so weird to hear that back. Okay, I have. Yeah, your your new novel, Attachments. Um, this is your first novel, isn't it? You know, it's it's my first thirty novels, but yeah, it, it took. It's, <laughs> I, you know, I understand that reference. I, do. I, I have friends who write a book a year. You know, I, I sent this copy to one of my friends. He's a, he's a pretty big author. He writes a book a year, and I go, look, I write a book a year too. <laughs> it's just the same book. Uh, right. <laughs> Well, I, I can imagine that screenwriting, uh, writing for film, has to be a collaborative process at some point. I, I know that at at uh, you know when you're in the middle of of the draft and it's it's you and your computer that that can be a very solitary um, uh, pursuit. But at some point, other people get involved, and in, and in taking your vision from the page to the screen is definitely a collaborative uh, process. Many, many people get involved in that. Um, writing a novel is, is it, it would seem to me is, is more of a solitary pursuit. At least it's, it's a solitary pursuit for a longer period of time. And, and still there are other people that get involved in the process with editors and publishers and, and, you know, all of that. Um, but, uh, you know, other than just the the differences on the face of the way um, a script is laid out is different from a novel manuscript. Um, how is writing a novel different for you than than writing a screenplay? Well, it was easier to go in that direction than the other way around. I, I don't know. It would have been much harder to be a novelist learning screenplay. Uh, the, the screenplay form is really... To, to the outside eye, it's really restrictive. There's, there's, there's only a couple things you can do and a whole bunch of things you can't do. But uh, when a screenplay, you learn a certain kind of discipline and economy of style, because no matter what story you're telling, you got about a hundred or so pages to tell it, and that's it. So if you're making up an alien world that no one's ever seen before, part of those 110 pages has got to be laying out the rules of that alien world because no one's ever seen it before. Right. If it's New York City, people know New York City. You have to do less. But either either way, uh, you have to learn in a screenplay to use as few words as possible to say as much as you can, because you just don't have the luxury of those words, and you don't have the luxury of going inside a character's head and telling anybody what they're thinking. So in a novel, as you can see in, in attachments, in a novel, you're inside, it has alternating voices. So every chapter, you're inside somebody else's head while they go through the story. I think there's six of them. So you're, you're hearing from six characters, you're inside six points of view while the story unfolds from each person's point of view. In a screenplay, you don't get that. And you don't get to say, you know, Bob thought about it before he did it. And you don't get to do two pages of what Bob's thinking is. In a screenplay, Bob does this, then Sarah does that, then Bob does that because Sarah did that, and it's all cause and effect from one event to the next. But a novel has to be that too. But you can just uh, you can go off the highway a little bit more. You know, you can you know you don't have to get somewhere in such a hurry. You can take four hundred pages to do something as long as those pages move. But there's no set length. There's no set way it has to be told. You can go into all kinds of different styles. You know, even in a book, changing something to italics, which I, I have to do a lot in, in, in attachments because to separate what's happening in the past, what's happening in the present, you don't even have that. You, know? you don't even have right. that in a screenplay. All that can be in a screenplay is what someone sees or what someone hears, what a reader sees and what an audience sees, because screenplays aren't read by readers. They're read by department heads and they're read by, you know, the art director is going to go in and look at the same piece of paper that the makeup person and the costume person and the cinematographer and the actor and the director and the electrical, all these different departments and, and uh, groups are looking at this blueprint, just like a house, the electrician, the plumber, they're all going to look at the same set of prints and interpret it their own way while keeping it that house. In a book, it, you're writing it on your own and I guess, again, my movie training made me really used to getting lots of feedback from lots of places, and I want that. So I got lots of feedback from everybody, and I took it in, and I incorporated that to the next version. 
in the end, it's all yours. That's the difference. Uh, as a script writer, your vision ends when you hand the thing in and, uh, and when you take the check. That is somebody else's vision. And if you're lucky enough to stay with it, which doesn't always happen, uh, then you're collaborating. You know, a director might need this, an actor might need this, and all these people might need, you know, their own separate things. And you're the one that's got to figure out how to serve all those masters. In a book, you're on your own. You get your feedback. You get the thing in shape. You send it to agents. You send it to editors. And uh, you start getting their opinions. And, you know, sometimes their opinion comes with a possible paycheck, and sometimes it doesn't. But I learned to be open to no, no matter who says it, no matter where it comes from, what is what is the feedback and are they right? No matter how much I might have to undo, you know, to, 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 to solve the problem that they seem to have solved, no matter how much I undo to take that, uh, I have to consider everything. And, and so I'm open to all kinds of things. But the weirdest thing, Hank, I never collaborated with anybody that was more stubborn and more difficult and harder to work with if there was something they didn't want to do than the characters in this book. They gave me more trouble than any <laughs> living human being uh, because there were times where it just it would have been a lot easier if I could just get them to, you know, you know, you, you write too. And any writer understands this and everybody you talk to understands this. At some point, if they don't take on a life of their own, if they don't stop being, you know, quote unquote, your characters, then it's dead there's nothing there, then they're just going to read like somebody's characters. They're not going to be people. And uh, thank God I've learned how to create people. And, and, and hopefully people reading the book are going to, and, and that's kind of the feedback I'm getting. It's like, I feel like I know these people. I feel like I want to know these people. I wish I knew these people. I want to keep knowing these people. When are you going to write the sequel? All that stuff. And, and the funny thing is, it is a good story. But the responses I'm getting are about how the people made people, how, how the readers feel. And to me, right. that's success. Absolutely. Um, Jeff, I'm, I'm fascinated with the beginnings of things. And, um, you know, writing is, is, is very um, closely akin to magic. And in, in, in that one moment, um, nothing about, attachments exist it 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 doesn't exist in any form uh and then uh f through some stroke of, of of whatever it is um a character walks onto the stage of your mind or you start thinking uh about a, a scenario that that maybe you had overheard somewhere or or something and then you know characters start populating that scenario and then just all of a sudden out of nowhere um attachments exist uh in in one form or another in, in your mind uh and then you know there there are things that have to be worked out in in character trajectories and 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 plot points and all of that stuff but attachments is a thing that then you know has to be worked out by you um but one moment it didn't exist and then the next moment it does in one form or another what is that first kernel of uh, of of an idea that usually comes to you is, is it a character um that that starts talking to you uh, or uh, is it a a scenario that that you maybe overheard on the news or something like that that then you start playing the what if game uh in your mind where do what's that beginning stage of a story like for you well that's funny the funny thing is you also just described lunch right how do you go how do you go from <laughs> zero to lunch right you know you have to have an idea that there's going to be lunch. There have to be ingredients. You got to, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff you have to do to go from not lunch, lunch never existing, to now you've got lunch. But in a story where the original thing kind of comes from, when I know I have it, so I'll tell you the second step. When I know I have it is when the characters do start talking in my head and I get a sense of their voice. Uh, with Sleepless, I had, I definitely, the night I got that idea, I had the bare bones for a story. And then at some point, I heard uh, the father and the son talking to each other. At the time, my daughter was four and a half years old, just closing in on five. And I just remember thinking, if I can get the way she and I talk to each other onto a piece of paper, I've got something. So that was the original thing that told me, okay, I, I heard him and his son talking. And I and had that kind of vibe, that kind of if you can think way back, whoever saw the movie, you know, to the scene where they're brushing their teeth together. 
that was one of the first scenes I heard in my head with those two, you know, um, and it was a really intimate, cute little scene, but I had that dynamic of how the father and son relate to each other. And no matter what happened, the vibe of that relationship, whether I was there on, on the set or not, that carried through Tom and Tom and Ross pulled that off beautifully. So uh, it, it usually is a what if Hank, you're right. It usually will, will actually the idea for attachments. It was um, what if some of the things that never really happened at the school that I went to actually happened, you know, so the bunch of things in it that almost happened or that could have happened that might've happened. And you know, it's, it's uh, you know, my mom kept telling me, I did go to a boarding school for two years in Pennsylvania, like the one in the in the book. And you know, some pretty dramatic stuff happened, but high school's dramatic for everybody. And my mom kept saying, you know, you should write about what happened to you at that school. And I would say, Mom, nobody gives a damn about what happened to a middle class Jewish kid in a boarding school. Forget about it. There's nothing that dramatic <laughs> happened. And and I'd write some things and she 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 was a good she wasn't a fan. If she didn't like something, you knew it. And she couldn't possibly fake it. I wish sometimes she could. But wherever I'd write, she'd say, oh, I like this, but you should still write about what happened to you at that school. And I'd say, Mom, nobody cares. And I'd go on to write something else. And even when I wrote Sleepless and she saw the first draft, she said, oh, I really love this. But you should still write about what happened to you at that school. So one day I finally listened. And I, uh, my mom lived about an hour and a half from where that school was. So one day I just for the hell of it drove up there. After 17 years of not being there, completely unannounced, there was no internet, there was no looking anybody up, and I wanted to see if this teacher who was really influential was still there for the heck of it. So I drove two hours up to Wilkes-Barre from Harrisburg and, you know, asked around, is Mr. This guy still here? And he was, and he answered the door and took a minute, but he remembered me, uh, and I spent the day with him, with him and his wife, and... As a, I was now 31 or 32, and I could ask him some of the things you can't ask when you're a student. And the funny thing is, he was 31 or 32 when these things were happening, and I was a kid, but when you're 15 and a 32-year-old might as well be 60, and I had no idea how young that really was. Right. So he told me his point of view on some things, and I just remember thinking, holy cow, a 32-year-old guy did that? And a guy my age did that? Could I have done that at this very age I'm at? And so after that day, I drove back, and the the elements of that story came to me. I, I this is 1988, Hank, and I, I two years before I thought of Sleepless, and and I I had a teacher and three students and a betrayal and a runaway, and that's all I knew. And from that, uh, you know, there was an incident that didn't happen, but I said I knew if that incident happened and it happened to me, I would not have been able to stay here. I would have had to run away, but I also knew being me. I wouldn't have had the courage to run away. So, but that character had no choice but to run. So I put him through what would have happened if that had happened to me and I ran away. And it's just sort of, they took on a life of their own. So a lot of the things in the book are things that actually, events that happened. And the one character in particular has more things in his history that happened in my history, but he responded to them differently than I did. Like I said, very stubborn, but you know, and I actually showed an early draft of this book to my mom while she was still alive. And she said, I love this, but I still think you should write about what happened to you when you went to that school. And I said, Mom, I'm never going to write about what happened to me at that school. This wasn't um, interesting enough. And we want that. I don't want to live a life that could be in somebody's novel. You know, I don't, I don't want things that messy. So, <laughs> right. you know, we put our characters through this stuff so that, so that we don't have to really go through it ourselves. And and the same thing, you do that for the audience. You know, people make choices in movies and in books that are examples to us. You know, I had a great teacher once said, you know, your life is either an example or a warning. So put that on your characters. Everything each character does is either an example or a warning. And you sort of piggyback those to a whole story. Hopefully, at the end, you have an example. Wow. So when you start thinking of the things that happened to you and or and then, you know, extrapolating that out to things that that could happen, um, you know, like you said, your life wasn't that interesting um, in, in from your perspective. But these what these characters go through um, is is either an example or a, or a warning. Um, h- how do you start? Uh, like like when you start fleshing out these characters, 
or, or I guess may, maybe a better way to ask it is, um, you know, in in novel writing, there are two camps that that people like to put writers in either pantsers or plotters or people that write by the seat of their pants or people that plot out what's going to happen ahead of time. Um, where do you fall? Always in the middle. Always in the middle. There's there's a little planning and there's a little um, not, you know, it's a little just seeing what happens. So I do know there, there are writers that have to cover their whole wall with index cards and, you know, those strings like in those crime scenes, you know, right. detectives <laughs> where this links to that. And they can't go forward until they've got all that figured out. Um, you know, Hitchcock did that with movies. He storyboarded the whole thing. So there was very room, very little room for uh, for um, <clears throat> improvisation, very little room for accidents. <clears throat> and a lot of writers are like that, that the way they, you know, the whole secret is how to organize your brain so that you can figure out how to get this stuff on paper. There are people that say, I have no idea what I'm going to write about, but I saw this flower and I'm going to have someone walk past that flower and we'll have Ulysses by the end of the time, by the time we're done. With me, <clears throat> again, from screenwriting training, I knew that before you go forward on a story, there's a couple things you have to know. And uh, with Sleepless, there were there's six basic things you need to know before you write a screenplay. And I sort of had that <clears throat> with <clears throat> with attachments that if you set up a premise where a teacher passes out and he calls out for two names and nobody knows who they are or why those names and the, even the people he's calling for don't know who they are. There, there's certain, you know, as a certain progressive lays itself out, progression lays itself out. So I knew there is a certain progression of events that have to happen, but I knew nothing besides that. I didn't even know which characters were going to show up or what they were going to do. So I didn't flesh out any characters. I sat there while they fleshed themselves out right in front of me. It's a weird process, but that's really, really what happened. I mean, I knew there was going to be a teacher. I knew there was going to be uh, two roommates. One was, you know, a Jewish kid who was going to be more cerebral and more searching and an Italian kid whose father was, uh, you know, very extremely rough on him and you know, to the point of abandonment and who had a gigantic chip on his shoulder, but was probably also secretly softer and more romantic than, than the guy who was going around being all romantic. And I knew there was a girl they were going to both fall in love with, but one of them met her first. That's it. That's all I knew. And I had discovered this technique of alter alternating voices. Uh, which I use in the book, you know, each chapter has a different heading and that heading is in that person's point of view as the story goes forward. I saw a friend do that in a short story that he wrote in high school and I loved it. And every now and then I'd see it again. I'd see, ooh, 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 I really love this technique, but I write movies, so there's really no way to do that. And when the idea came to make this into a book, uh, I went, ooh, I can, it's just so weird. You know, you buy this kitchen tool, right, that you never <laughs> use. And you go, oh, my God, that's what this, I can finally use this thing. Everybody's been giving me crap for having this thing in the kitchen. It clogs up the drawers, but this is the perfect use for it. And I, like, dusted off that technique, and it was exactly the way to tell the story. Because it was a complete, once I had the framework for it, you know, you guys, I need you to get to, I need this guy to walk in on these two by this point in the story. And I need, at the end, there's going to be a big hospital room scene. And, I, and that's it. That's all I know. How do we get there? And I would let them lead me. I would, like a parent, I'd sort of suggest, you know, here, here are the basic principles of who we are and what we're doing, but you got to express this in your own way. And they invented every action. They surprised me every single step of the way. Every idea I had for them was not as good as an idea as they had for themselves. And it was more of, it was, it was like, you know, what do they call that? The, the monkey riding the tiger think it's the one in charge. <laughs> That's the experience I had. But we had a, it was a collaboration. We had a common goal. It was, you know, my job was story logic. You know, guys, this has to make sense. And the right. next thing is, you know, two people who haven't seen each other in 17 years have got to see each other eventually. And we got to get to that. And I'm going to put you guys in the situation and now you deal with it. But so the storyteller and me knew certain things were coming. But the story experience in me, I, I this developed for me just the way it's going to develop for you when you read it, which is I never knew what the next page was going to be ever. Love it. That's kind of scary. But that is that is scary. But but the end product is is usually amazing when it happens that way. 
Yeah, you know, in a movie, I know more about what's supposed to happen, and then the characters will definitely take turns, and you have to consider that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how much time, there's a really quick story about the, the, the movie I did with Ron Howard, but not to because it's name dropped, just because it's a real good example of what happens. We, we had, um, he had hired me to adapt a book, <clears throat> and the book needed a lot of changes, and, and uh, but ultimately, and, 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 Essentially, it was a book about a, a guy who discovers he's well settled in life now. He's married kids and he discovers that this woman he knew in college who's like that woman that comes through your life and just destroys you and loves you and all that stuff. And then she moves on. You can never quite hold her. He finds out through watching a documentary on PBS or something that she's homeless and she's in New York. So he has to drop everything and he goes to New York to try and save her. That was the basic framework. And uh, in the book, the guy was a music teacher and Ron Howard didn't really like that atmosphere. And I had just read a story about ministers and ministers' wives. So I said, let's make him a minister. And he loved that. So the idea that we had decided on was he was going to go and find her. And his whole job was going to be this heartbreaking thing of he was going to have to get her to commit herself to get help because she was what we now call bipolar. And... That was going to be his act of love, go rescue her, risk his marriage, because his wife didn't understand what was going on. And I was writing towards that. We were going to get to the scene where he convinces her with some other people's help to go check herself in so she can stay alive. I got within about 20 pages of that where that was going to happen. And I said, you know what? She's going to kill herself. And I didn't know that. And I had to call him up and say, listen, there's a hitch. I know we planned on this, but I think she's got to kill herself, and here's why, and it'll take about three weeks longer than, you know, than your delivery, and he said, go ahead and do it, and it took me two weeks just to start to write that scene, because it was killing me. I had this character. I didn't know what was going to happen, but then it became that that, that third act became this race where he, he knows she's going to do it, and he's trying to get to her while she's it was a beautiful, beautiful thing, and it didn't get filmed. And it's too bad, but that's just a case of this is something that was really planned out. And you know, I had to have this approved before I went and go and write it because they're giving a ton of money for it. It's not like I'm going to go write a circus picture when you know. <laughs> right. um, so you know, I was I was in check with, not with Ron Howard every single day, but with his person, you know, his story editor. And uh, I actually, he's the guy I called first. I said, "Look, I think she's got to die," and he said, "You better call Ron." So that's that's what happened, and I got his permission. But that's a case of a story taking on a life of itself, and then you have to listen to that and consider that. He could have said, no, pull it back. He could have easily said that. Um, but he said, no, try it. That's what makes a great director. Give it a try. But with attachments, they did whatever they wanted. When it, they, it was As long as they followed the rule of this has to go forward, that's the only rule I gave them. We have to go forward. Each one of you has to pursue the thing that you're after until this, until all these things converge and then we'll figure it out. We'll throw the bomb in the room and then figure it out. So it just, it's different with everyone, but this one, these people were so difficult, so strong minded and I didn't flesh them out. They did it right in front of me because if I would have fleshed them out, they'd have been a little more compliant. Right. Right. I love it when that happens. When you're hearing this, Attachments is available everywhere uh, that you buy books. Uh, we're going to put links to it in the show notes where you can uh, order it online uh, if your favorite bookstore is not open or not accessible at the moment. Um, Jeff, if uh, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that, they, that you do, uh, is there a place where they can connect with you online? There is a – as of this week, there is a jeffarch.com website. But also, um, I'm really accessible on Facebook and Instagram, and probably Facebook more. I've never figured out tr Twitter. I I don't know how the, I don't know how it, three buttons and I get it wrong all the time. So, I'm well, it's a bit of a dumpster. Facebook. It's a bit <laughs> of know, a dumpster fire anyway over on Twitter. We, we, it's you know. it's I, I haven't <laughs> I haven't figured it out. You know all the different threads that I keep it again. And, and it's you can have conversations. You can share photographs and everything. So I'm I'm absolutely accessible. I love talking to people. 
it beats writing and uh, <laughs> you know and in- Instagram as well I'm gonna have to do a little bit more of that but I just love the give and take of Facebook and, you know I don't I just deal in like a closed you know, I don't have this thing open to the public or anything so that uh, I haven't been trolled it hasn't gotten nasty that's uh, great I would, a couple of friends that politically when they would I didn't mind the politics part of it but when they would start calling each other stupid I would have to put a stop to that because <laughs> You know, <laughs> invariably that happens. We're not. We're, I'm not here to call somebody. You know, call that on your page. Don't call somebody stupid on my page. If we're both friends. That's right, it. right, right. Well, we'll put links there uh, as well, so that that people can connect with you. Um, Jeff, this has been so much fun chatting. We're going to send everyone to pick up a copy of Attachments. Please thank do. you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Hank, thank you. Great to talk to you. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing or proofreading Pico's House is the one stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.